The story begins with the black dragon named Vritra together with his minions, in a city creating chaos, according to the police officer at the back due to a single stroke from the black Vritra, 90% of the base's attack functionality has ceased, and the general conclude that is it over for the humanity. The dragon replied, then disappear, then the dragon cast a powerful spell on the humans. After the powerful cast of the dragon Vritra. Wide shot of a desolate landscape, with a darkened sky overhead. The air feels heavy. Dust blows through the cracked earth. A lone figure stands in the distance he silhouetted, his sword sheathed on his back. Closer shot of the figure. The wind blows, lifting his hair slightly. We can now see his face handsome, with piercing eyes, and a calm expression. He's older than he used to be but still carries an aura of unshakable confidence. Zoomed in on the man's hand gripping the hilt of his sword, a symbol of power and legacy. His fingers are relaxed but ready. The man steps forward, his foot crunching on the gravel. The scene is still, and the only sound is the wind. We see the worn-down village in the distance, cut to the entrance of the village. The protagonist walks through the gates, his face slightly more visible now. A few villagers glance up, whispering among themselves. A close-up on one villager's face fear and disbelief mixing in their expression. There was a young guy who appeared in front of the dragon he is the protagonist of the story his name is Agito, a tall guy with blonde hair. The humans were shocked by his appearance and recognized him as the sword saint of the eight blades. He felt sorry because he was a little bit late for the battle, and leaving the rest to him. In the year 19xx, there were gates to other dimensions appeared worldwide, and lots of dragons emerged from these gates led by powerful dragons but humanity obtained the mysterious power known as magic. The humans began to unite to fight back against the monsters by using magic. And so, while paying a heavy price, humanity drove back to the armies of the monsters, after the other monsters were defeated, the final battle was about to begin, Tensaki approached the general informing him that the six dragons were defeated and the only left is the black dragon Vritra and telling him that the other humanity are already at their limits and can't fight back the black dragon Vritra but Agito is the only one left who can still fight the black dragon. The general has no choice but to give all the trust to Agito to fight back the dragon. The dragon told Agito though he managed to defeat the other six dragons he couldn't defeat him by using Agito's sword skills, but Agito replied that it was not just a sword skill, but he could cut him down with everything he had. Tensaki noticed that the humans carry an abundance of latent magical power but Agito is different from the other humans and the general noticed that his magical power doesn't even amount to a single basic spell released by the other humans but Agito is the one without magic, and so he invented it. Agito unleashed his sword with infinite magic filling the atmosphere with the eight-blade swordsmanship and attacked the dragon by shouting the word, Here I come, to the black dragon. The black dragon said that Agito was a fool to attack him by using only a sword skill and making him turn to dust. The black dragon unleashed his power on Agito called the black reign of the abyss but nothing happened, Agito attacked the black dragon again by using the eight-blade swordsmanship thunderbolt god. The general was shocked by looking at Agito fighting back against the black dragon and asking Tensaki if Agito damaged the Vritra. The general and Tensaki were puzzled by Agito's attack without magic to this extent. The black dragon was also puzzled by Agito's performance attacking him and saying that Agito was different from the other humans he faced. The black dragon attacked Agito and unleashed his power on the humans and Tensaki was rattled and tried protecting the general by using her power, Agito discovered the black dragon's true power leaving him no choice but to use and risk all his powers too, the eight-blade secret technique. Agito unleashes the magical spell Akatsuki's eight reincarnations this magic spell absorbs and fuses surrounding elemental magic, generating explosive power. Agito begins to attack the black dragon Vritra. Tensaki noticed that Agito is fighting on equal terms with Vritra or even better than the dragon. However, the more Agito uses his power the more his life is drained because it's a double-edged sword. Tensaki become aware that if they are behind him he has to protect them and might not be able to win the battle and before Vritra notices their presence during the battle they need to find a way out to escape from chaos. 
Agito begins to attack Vritra again but Vritra tells Agito that he is being ridiculous for sacrificing himself for slim hopes for sentiments, Tensaki is aware that Vritra noticed their presence. While Vritra is preparing his other magic spell to unleash Agito thinking that if he dodges the magic spell everyone around him will die but Vritra is telling them that they are just insects that are easily defeated. Agito has no choice and he calls Tensaki and says sorry for what he will do in the future and leaves her the rest of it because he thinks about what could be the possible outcome of their battle. Still, Tensaki tries to stop Agito from what he is planning. Still, it is too late, the Black Dragon unleashed his powerful magic spell to Agito which is the Black Curtain of Annihilation while Agito fully released the Akatsuki's eight reincarnations to Vritra and also the eight blade swordsmanship and telling the Black Dragon that this is the end of their battle. On the final judgment Agito and Vitra's power was being dodged, they were both shouting because of the intense battle they made together while Tensaki was also using her power to save the other humans by the unleashed power of Agito and Vritra. Vritra died, while Agito dropped to the ground and became weak Tensaki shouted and ran to Agito and noticed that Agito's wound was terrible and said do not move. After that, the general was happy saying they made it or did Agito make it. Agito replied that he shattered the core so it wouldn't rise again. The humans were so very happy to hear that the dragon won't rise again and thought did humanity survive? They were crying because of the happiness they felt that they survived the battle but at that moment Tensaki was trying to heal Agito from all the pain and damage he got while fighting back at Vritra, and speaking of Vritra his voice came up saying how pitiful they are and no changes of their plan and they will awaken the strongest dragon god which is Ragna because the conditions have been met. And Agito was completely shocked of what Vritra said. Vritra said that they were thankful for the dragon god's blessing and that the six dragons that they defeated would revive after a hundred years. The dragons thinking that Agito's struggles were all in vain. Agito was very shocked by what the dragon said about the strongest dragon god Ragna, realizing that after defeating the six dragons, nothing was resolved. But wasn't done worrying about Agito's situation because the healing she did was not working. Agito questioned himself if he used Akatsuki's reincarnations too much that it caused him more weaker and he also noticed that his consciousness was fading that he was asking for another chance in his life thinking that he couldn't die yet because he knew that his battle was not over yet. The last thing he saw was something similar to a meteor that fell down and below it was a magic circle. After a moment he hears a human voice speaking about his vitals and his consciousness realizing that it is so very noisy around him. He opened his eyes and wandered around and he realized that he was in the hospital and surrounded by devices that he had never seen before and thought that it was just a military facility. After that, he heard about the world being saved by the sword, Agito of the Eight Blades and the other four heroes that brought peace realizing that the year he was in was the 100th anniversary of the battle that fought and brought peace to the humans. He was completely shocked and confused about the situation he was in right now after hearing the news on the TV. He looked at himself in the mirror and thought that it could be that he was being reincarnated and wondered what was going on in the world. Another breaking news came up. Talks about the gates that had been continuously active since last month and today another 50 gates have been activated with abnormal magical tremors occurring across the region some of the netizens speculate that these gates could be the return of the six dragons and the guild of sorcerers has issued a heightened the alert of it. Agito came back to the memories he had of what the Black Dragon Vritra said that the six dragons would revive in a hundred years. Agito is still confused as to why he was still reincarnated, but still thankful that it is a miraculous chance to live again while the six dragons have already returned. But thinking about that he also thinks that the awakening of the dragon god Ragna must be near. And telling the dead Vritra that don't think that everything will go according to their plan because he will stop the awakening of the Ragna. After a day of realizing everything, he slowly copes with something, and he needs to accept everything where he is right now. His name is Mitsuruji Agito a student of Kagura Magic Academy who lost his parents at a young age and lives alone. Still, his name ages ago and his name now are way too similar but apart from that Agito wants to inform this era sorcerers, guild about the six dragons and the awakening of the dragon god Ragna. Agito tried his sword skill to a can to test his ability to see if it was still working and to start moving. 
While Ajito is walking in the city he sees a press conference of sorcerers at a sorcerer's guild. The interviewees ask the sorcerer about what is the reason for the gate activation and the number of monster appearances is also reportedly increasing and there's no need for the concern. Perhaps they dispatched an S-rank and higher-ranked personnel across the regions to maintain peace and order and also powerful monsters that were being born on the other side of the gate and they will continue to make every effort to uncover the cause. Ajito was impressed with the sorcerer's response that according to him, this era's guild seemed competent as well, and also if he went to the guild right now and explained his situation it would likely alert the six dragons to his presence but for now he needs to live as Mitsuruji Ajito until he can monitor the enemy's movements. Ajito thinks he was purposely reincarnated as a student at a Kagura Magic Academy. He also has in mind that if he can gather information easily there and things will go well it might even form a connection with the guild and high rankers in Kagura Magic Academy. Most importantly, he said that he needs strong allies to fight with the six dragons if he might be the one to fight them, he can meet a skilled student maybe he will tell them the truth. While Ajito was roaming he saw a student unleashing their powers, the first one was a young tall guy with black hair named Yamada, he unleashed a flame that turned into a fireball and might smite his enemy. At this time the professor complimented Yamada for improving a lot so that his magic could aim for a B rank, and Yamada was feeling thankful for his professor's guidance. The second performer unleashed his power on the ice needle and the sand rain but Ajito was a little bit disappointed with what their magics could do because they were too weak for him and they were just below what they used to call new recruits a long time ago. Ajito went to his classroom still thinking about where could he find strong allies in a place where no one could pass his standard of magic skills. While entering the classroom the three guys with a red hair guy at the center, white hair guy at his right side, and the big guy with black hair called Ajito as a sword saint, they asked Ajito if his injuries were healed already. Ajito thinks that they are just concerned about his disappearance and discovering his identity but little does he know the new Ajito in his living era is being bullied by the three guys. He also thinks that they would mess with him because of his name, but Ajito ponders that he should play his part as a Mitsuruji Ajito. Ajito acts like nothing happened as if he knows everything, Ajito asks the three guys who they are but the red-haired guy is so mad at Ajito's question. The red-haired guy grabbed Ajito's collar and tried to fight Ajito and called him a low rank but instead the red-haired guy introduced himself as a great A-rank Yuki Hibaha. Yuki Hibaha kicked Ajito away and told him that Ajito needed to know his place and grovel like the worm he was. But the other Ajito's acquaintance was laughing and talking about Hibaha that even though he is an A-rank he is still just a candidate but the other one on the other side was informing the other guys that they might hear them talking behind their back and Ajito is enough for them to get bullied. Yuki Hibaha noticed Ajito's sword and he even denounced it rusty old sword that suited him as the perpetual lowest rank. Hibaha said Mitsuruji Ajito needs to stop dreaming that he will be like the hero Ajito of the Eight Blades because it will never happen and the only thing that they have in common is their cool name, Ajito laughed, and appointing them that they were the reason why Ajito was in the hospital because of bullying, Hibaha what Ajito's attitude that he has shown to them. Instead, Ajito said that he is busy and suggested Yuki Hibaha to hone his skills instead of wasting his time on petty stuff. Ajito's classmates are stunned and Yuki Hibaha gets angrier with what Ajito said he even says that Ajito wants to get killed, the two companions of Hibaha were getting anxious because Hibaha is getting mad again it might end up getting Ajito's back in the hospital again. Yuki Hibaha unleashed his flame magical power and said if Ajito was eager to die then he could get what he wanted, the other students were shocked and ran while Yuki Hibaha was getting angrier and said die as you wish for Ajito. The flame exploded, and Ajito held his sword and ready to unleash his magical spell which is the whirlwind splash. Yuki Hibaha fly away due to the impact of Ajito's power. Everyone was completely shocked, because Hibaha's exploding flame was nullified and cancelled out the magic of Hibaha who's nearly an A rank while Ajito is only an F rank. Hibaha told himself that Matsuruji Ajito could be the real Ajito but he could not accept it and tried to unleash his power again someone came in, a girl with long hair and a sword by her side, she was an A-rank and a descendant of the four great heroes, she is Amazahi Erika. 
Yuki Hibahat is angrily shocked while the others are happy seeing her getting back from the overseas expedition. Amazahi Erika will try to pull out his sword and not only use attack magic indoors but bullying classmates for fun, Amazahi stopped Hibaha's released magic through his sword. And if Hibaha won't stop Amazahi Erika will deal with Yuki Hibaha only herself. Hibaha left with a disappointment, while Ajito was left behind. Amazahi Erika felt relief and talked to his companions, they welcomed Amazahi getting back overseas as they expected from an A rank. Ajito is thinking again that what if Amazahi Erika is Yuka's descendant and maybe he can share his situation with her. Yuki Hibaha is not done with his angriness with Ajito thinking that they humiliated him. He is mad with Ajito and Amazahi thinking that he will kill them for sure. After all that happened, a man suddenly appeared, he was tall with violet long hair he was the six dragon sub-commander for ravaging, he is Odium, and saying that he came there to eliminate the bloodline of those Isar heroes, he pinpointed a person which is Mitsuruji Ajito he thinks that Ajito has a revolting name but it seems that he is an unexpected catch, and on behalf of Lord Rubel's appearance who will soon fully revive. Amazaki Erika happily announced that she would be the one who would take care of Mitsuruji Ajito. While Odium is talking to other students, Yuki Hibaha can't get over how they humiliated him. He wants to call them out after school but his companions are afraid and tell Yuki Hibaha to forget Mitsuruji, but Amazaki, is the descendant of the four great heroes. But Yuki Hibaha doesn't care who she is, he will kill anyone who looks down on him no matter who they are. While Yuki grabbed the collar of his companion, Odium suddenly appeared and said that Yuki Hibaha's twisted spirit was truly splendid. Yuki Hibaha was shocked at the person who appeared in front of him, and Odium felt sorry for his appearance. He introduced himself as Odium, the loyal subordinate of the mighty flame dragon, Lord Rubel. Odium said that he would see if Yuki Hibaha can assist him. Odium held Hibaha's forehead to pass some magic to Hibaha, after that a powerful sign at Hibaha's neck came out. Hibaha's companion were worried of Hibaha's situation right now they asked if he is okay. Hibaha's eyes turn red and he feels like his magic magic becomes doubled. Hibaha's friends were afraid of what could be possible of what Hibaha could do to them they tried to stop him but Hibaha is unstoppable, he unleashed his powerful magic. Odium was happy seeing Hibaha become more powerful and saying that it is all coming together nicely and now that he had pawns in his place. Shall we begin, Odium said. The Sirank Gate is called the Third Peak of Skull Mountain. On that day, they will conduct a field test in dungeon, they can work alone or in teams but they must defeat at least five monsters in dungeon just in case. But they do not have to worry they invited an A-rank instructor to oversee the test. Ajito thinks and remembers what he saw last time if they will have a field test against monsters are they capable with their skills like that. Ajito saw Amazaki and thanked her for helping him out earlier and Amazaki was happy to hear that and said that she only gave them a little scare Amazaki also said that if ever Ajito is in trouble he can let her know and next time Hibaha will give him trouble she will punch Hibaha right in the face. They both laughed, and Ajito liked her fiery spirits. Amazaki added that those types only targeted people who were weaker than themselves. Thinking that picking a descendant of the four great heroes who fought alongside the sword saint, and so he thinks that the four great heroes all lived happy lives. Amazaki becomes confused about what Ajito thinks because he looks like he has a lot of question in his mind. Amazaki asked Ajito what was wrong and Ajito replied nothing instead he said he would talk to Amazaki later. After Ajito left, Amazaki talking to herself that what Mitsuruji Ajito showed this morning was not magic and also it was not Hibaha's failed spellcasting but it was unmistakably swordsmanship. When it comes to dispersing the exploding flame orb it was a shockwave created by an incredible speed draw even the S-rank magic swordsman could not pull that off ANF if there is someone capable of doing such a feat is only the 8-blade Ajito. Amazaki starts to question Mitsuruji's life who is exactly Mitsuruji Ajito. Back to the third peak gate at Skull Mountain, there's an ogre appeared a giant purple monster with yellow eyes and a horn. The three students who went inside the third peak gate prepared to release their fire. 
The guy with green hair asked what works against the monster but the professor only told them just always shoot so they could beat the monster, but instead the ogre fight them back and released his weapon to one of the attackers. The guy with the brown hair dropped out when the monster attacked them, the monster kept on attacking them until Agito appeared in front of them and started attacking the monster using his sword. After that, Agito asked them if they were alright and reminded them that if they are dealing with ogres again they need to keep distance when attacking them. The green-haired one was shocked what Agito did to the ogre and said that he took it down instantly and the other one was amazed with Agito. What Agito thinks of them was right that the skill level of the students of Kagura Magic Academy is low and he should finish the field test quickly. But still, the two guys at the back was not thankful enough that Agito saved them but instead, they are still talking about him behind his back they still think that what Agito did is just a stroke of luck and not a real skill of Agito. Agito continues to find a way to connect with someone influential in the guild. Agito leaves the area, and while walking Agito discovers something he sees a lot of ogres and minions that are dead and he looks confused about what is happening, Agito sees the red-haired guy and says is it Hibaha that he sees and the red-haired guy replies that he is not Hibaha but instead he said he is Mitsuruji and started attacking Agito and shouted, kill. The red-haired guy unleashes his magic spell on Agito and becomes more scary and evil. Agito envisions that his magical power is unnaturally amplified and his movements are strange. Agito doesn't want to fight back, but instead, he is observing Hibaha's actions. Agito started thinking and he only saw bones that Hibaha cannot feel any pain. Hibaha started drooling and asked to help to Agito because he couldn't control himself. Agito is demented, and remembering his battles a long time ago that looks like the same with Hibaha's situation. Agito come up with the solution and tell Hibaha that leave the rest to him. Agito raised his fingertips and presses it to Hibaha's forehead, Hibaha's sign at the neck is slowly losing and he falls down to Agito's hand. Agito suspected that someone is watching them and tell him that he need to show himself and the other person started laughing, Agito put down Hibaha to the ground and preparing himself of what comes next. The other person started talking to Agito and said that he found the perfect plaything and perhaps he should bring Agito before Amazaki Erika. After that conversation, the other person introduced himself to Agito and it was Odium the loyal deputy of Lord Rubel who was watching them all the time, he also added that the six dragons will soon fully revive and unleashes his power again to Agito and told him that he is Agito's executioner. There's a lot of circles around Agito and it called Mandala a dark dimension power. Agito counterattacked to Odium's magic spell and started cutting all of his magic Odium was shocked and can't believe what Agito did. After attacking, Agito speaks that the resurrection of the six dragons must be near and Agito told him in a scary voice that all Odium schemes he will cut them all down. Wide shot of the battleground, an open, rocky landscape surrounded by mountains. The sky is dark, filled with swirling clouds. Odium stands on one side, his dark, intense aura radiating outward. Agito is on the opposite side, his posture calm but ready, eyes locked onto his opponent. Close up on Odium's face. His expression is cold, calculating. His eyes gleam with a sense of superiority, as if he already knows how this fight will end. Close up on Agito's face. His eyes are sharp and focused, betraying no emotion, though there's a faint sense of determination in his gaze. He's ready for whatever comes. Wide shot of both warriors as the tension heightens, the wind begins to whip around them, signaling the start of the battle. Agito sees that Odium is coming to him and pulling up his sword to defend himself and talks to Odium saying that Odium seems to be in high spirits and why he harmed humans, Odium replied, because it is fun. Agito threw Odium away and started a fight again. Odium retelling Agito that the war 100 years ago was the year moment for him, that when he hunt, it is best to leave a path for the prey to escape. The air is tense as Odium and Agito stand facing each other, swords drawn, ready to clash. But Odium's expression is momentarily distant, a flicker of hesitation in his eyes as his mind drifts away from the present. A mother and a child running but Odium appeared before them, 
the thrill of that moment was once odium very happy seeing and hearing a child scream of a child watching their controlled parent killing them. Agito getting more angrier, close up on odium's eyes. His pupils dilate, and his focus shifts from Agito to something far away. The faintest shadow of pain crosses his face. Seeing Odium's face that he is enjoying telling the story to Agito and telling that if the dragon god awakens together with his minions and monsters he will get to experience it all too well and he won't let Agito interfere again. Odium keeps on laughing but Agito, who has been reading Odium's movements all along, sees the opening. Agito sidesteps with lightning speed, leaving Odium wide open. In a flash, Agito strikes at Odium's hands, aiming to disarm him. Odium wanted to fight back with Agito and shouting that Agito is nothing but a worthless trash for them to hunt. The tense of the both fighters are getting more stronger, Odium released his magic and telling Agito that he will burn his body and won't let anyone recognize his body. And the magic called Meteor Shower, he intends to destroy the entire gate but Agito in a glaze eyes telling Odium that it can't be helped. Agito uses his eight-blade swordmanship, the rending sky blade, the rending KY blade is an attack so fast and powerful that it can split the very sky itself. To unleash it requires complete mastery over one's own body and mind. Agito counterattacked the released magic of Odium. Odium, enraged and desperate to win, continues to attack Agito with reckless abandon. His strikes grow wilder as the fight drags on, and his rage clouds his judgment. Though his raw power is immense, his lack of technique makes him vulnerable to Agito's precise counters. Odium is struck by the overwhelming power and precision of Agito's move, and his words reflect both his envy and acknowledgement of Agito's skill. Odium's pulse quickened. He had been here before. The feeling, the sensation of helplessness. That technique, his mind flashed back to that day. A day that haunted him, a day that had shattered his confidence and tarnished his pride. He could still hear the screams of his soldiers, the crumbling of the earth beneath their feet as the sky itself seemed to tear open that it was Agito's blade, the rending sky blade, the very technique that had wiped out his entire ruble force. The memory rushed through his mind, vivid and clear as if it had happened only moments ago. Agito stood before him, calm and unshaken, his movements fluid and precise. The genius swordsman was a whirlwind of grace and control, effortlessly dodging Odium's blows, parrying them with a near-insulting ease. It was a sight that grated on Odium's nerves. He had always believed that power alone would be enough to break anyone. Yet Agito's swordsmanship his quiet, measured precision was like a wall that Odium's rage could not break. I heard he died in that war, Odium muttered under his breath, his voice low and heavy with suspicion. Has he reincarnated? Agito, as always, gave no immediate response. His eyes remained as calm as the still waters of a distant lake. His sword hovered in front of him, its blade glinting in the dim light of the battlefield. The storm of battle seemed to have no effect on him. He was like a stone in the river, unyielding and unaffected by the chaos around him. Odium's chest tightened once again. His thoughts had spiraled into confusion, but now there was only one thing left for him to do is to fight. At the center of it all, Agito stood tall, his expression calm and unwavering, as though nothing in the world could shake his resolve. His sword, the symbol of his genius, gleamed with the light of the dying sun, still in his hand as he faced down Odium, the man who had once believed himself invincible. Odium, on the other hand, was a vision of rage and spite. His breaths were harsh, his body battered and worn, but his eyes burned with an unholy fire. There was no retreat in his mind, no fear in his heart. Only the desperate need for revenge, the craving to crush the very person who had once annihilated his forces and left him humiliated. What an unlucky man, Odium sneered, his lips curling into a vicious smile. He took a step forward, his eyes flashing with a cold, cruel light. You are fated to die again. Odium's hands clenched tighter around. The weight of the past, the sting of failure, it was all building inside him, and with each second that passed, 
his need for retribution grew more desperate. The battle had reached a fever pitch. The ground beneath their feet cracked and crumbled, scarred by the ferocity of their combat. Agito and Odium were locked in a deadly dance, their magics flashing in the dim light like the final strokes of fate itself, yet, despite Odium's rage and relentless assault, something was different now. Odium's body twitched violently as his rage consumed him completely. His mouth opened, and a guttural, inhuman growl erupted from his throat. His form began to change slowly at first, then with an accelerating fury. His muscles bulged grotesquely, the veins on his skin throbbing as they expanded outward like twisted rivers of blackened blood. His eyes, once human, now glowed with a terrifying, unnatural light crimson as the fires of hell itself. His fingers curled into claws, sharp and deadly, as his body contorted, the very structure of his being bending in unnatural ways. The armor that had once protected him shattered like brittle glass under the force of his transformation, revealing the monstrous creature within. The skin beneath his armor darkened to a sickly, charcoal black, and jagged, spiked growths protruded from his back and shoulders, giving him the appearance of a creature born from the deepest pits of darkness. He was no longer Odium, the man. He was Odium, the monster. Agito stood firm, his eyes unwavering as they locked with Odium's. The swordsman was ready. He knew what was coming next. This was it. The moment of truth. Odium had fully embraced the power of the dragon gods blessing a power so intense, so godlike, that it transformed him into something beyond human comprehension. And it was in this moment that Odium would show Agito just how far he was willing to go. I won't show mercy anymore. Odium's voice rumbled, deep and full of certainty, as though the words themselves were a curse. He stepped forward, his monstrous form dwarfing Agito's. This, this is the dragon god's blessing. He lifted his clawed hand into the air, and for a moment, the atmosphere seemed to shift. The ground trembled, the sky above darkened, and the wind howled as if the world itself recognized the weight of the power he now commanded. Agito's grip on his sword tightened ever so slightly, his gaze never wavering from Odium's monstrous form. The man or monster before him had clearly lost his mind, completely consumed by the godlike power he now wielded. But Agito knew better than anyone that there was always a way to overcome even the most overwhelming power. The Dragon God's Blessing, huh? Agito murmured, his voice quiet but carrying the weight of his experience. So you're finally showing your trump card. The air around them seemed to freeze for a moment as if the universe itself was holding its breath in anticipation of what would happen next. Agito's calm was like a sharp contrast to the storm Odium had become, a quiet, unyielding force in the face of chaos. As Odium's eyes glazed over, the weight of his failure settling in, Agito stepped forward and raised his sword, ensuring that the fight was about to start. There would be no second chances, no more opportunities to rise again. Odium shouted the moment the dungeon began to shake, a deep, rumbling force reverberated through the walls, sending tremors down the corridors. The air grew thick with the feeling of impending disaster, as the very foundation seemed to quiver under an unseen power. Amazaki, her face grim, turned to the others, her voice rising above the chaos. Everyone, escape immediately, she commanded, her tone sharp with urgency. His eyes flickered with concern as the shaking intensified. The dungeon's stability was rapidly deteriorating, and there was no time to waste. Without hesitation, the adventurers scrambled, fear etched into their faces as they rushed for the exits, knowing that something catastrophic was about to unfold. The ground cracked beneath them, and the walls groaned as if the dungeon itself was alive and fighting to hold together. But the danger was too great. Amazaki shouted again, his voice the last thing they heard before the darkness of the dungeon seemed to swallow them whole. The adventurers, who had been desperately scrambling to find their way to the exit, froze at the sudden shift in the air. It was as though the entire dungeon was holding its breath. The tension was suffocating, and a deep, primal instinct screamed within them that something was wrong something much darker and more powerful than anything they had encountered before was approaching. 
Amazaki, who had been on the edge of the group, suddenly stopped dead in her tracks. Her normally calm expression twisted into one of grave concern. Her sharp eyes scanned the tremors, listening to the unnatural rumbling, feeling the pulse of the dungeon as it throbbed with an energy that was growing stronger with every passing second. It wasn't just a monster, nor a trap set by the dungeon. It was something far worse. Her voice, when it came, was low but filled with an urgency that cut through the fear spreading among the group, it's here. The words were barely a whisper, but they carried the weight of a grim realization. Extremely powerful, and it's coming from deeper inside. Amazaki went inside and she saw Ajito fighting back with Odium the monster. He didn't need to say more. The look in his eyes told them all they needed to know whatever it was, it was something terrifying. Something that would make the dangers they had faced until now seem like child's play. Amazaki blinked, momentarily stunned by the sight. She knew Ajito by reputation, of course, but seeing him here, of all places, in the heart of this increasingly unstable dungeon, felt impossible. Mitsuruji, why are you here? The words escaped her lips before she could stop them, the surprise evident in her voice. Ajito's expression remained as calm as ever, his posture unwavering. The quiet strength that emanated from him was like a rock in the middle of a storm. His sword was poised in his hand, but there was no aggression in his stance just the cold certainty of someone who knew the battle had already been decided. Odium's form wavered, the darkness that had once filled him with godlike power now crumbling under the weight of Agito's resolve. His monstrous body trembled as though something inside him was shaking perhaps it was fear, perhaps it was the bitter realization that his fate had been sealed long ago, and now, the time had come for it to be fulfilled. The blade cut through the air with an unmistakable precision, and for a brief moment, it seemed as though time itself had frozen. Agito's sword met its mark with a sharp, sickening sound, slicing cleanly through Odium's monstrous form. A gasp of pain escaped Odium's lips as he staggered backward, his monstrous body unable to withstand the force of Agito's strike. The power of the dragon god's blessing, which had once given him such confidence, now seemed irrelevant in the face of Agito's certainty, in the face of a man who had fought countless battles and survived through sheer will alone. The air was thick with tension. The dungeon had become a battleground its walls shaking violently, as though the very earth beneath them was alive with some deep, primal energy. As Agito stood in the center of the chaotic scene, his eyes narrowed, his senses sharp, every fiber of his being was tuned into the strange, pulsing power that radiated from deeper within the dungeon. Before him stood the creature, a hulking figure with muscles like forged steel, its body enhanced by some dark, unnatural force. Agito's lip curled in a slight sneer as he watched the creature's slow, lumbering turn. What a letdown, he muttered under his breath, the words soft but filled with contempt. His gaze remained fixed on the creature as it roared, charging again with all the force it could muster. But Agito's sharp eyes saw through it all. So, it's only the body that's been enhanced. Just kidding. The words cut through the tension like a blade. They were mocking, filled with an eerie joy, as though the monster had been toying with him all along. Just kidding. The words echoed in Agito's mind. His dark eyes burned with an insidious light, and the unholy energy that radiated from him felt stronger, more oppressive, than ever. His form was no longer just monstrous it was a being of pure, relentless power, and now it pulsed with dark vitality. Agito's grip tightened on his sword, his heart pounding. This wasn't a monster. This was something far worse. Her breath quickened as she crouched, her hands tightly gripping the hilt of her sword. Her sharp eyes scanned the wreckage of the battlefield the destruction, the dark energy that poured from the creature before him. A surge of oppressive power filled the air, something ancient and malevolent. Amazaki's breath caught in his throat as she quickly assessed the situation. Her team, some of the most experienced and powerful adventurers in their guild, were struggling to hold their ground against the beast. The monster before him Odium, now fully regenerated and more terrifying than ever loomed like a nightmare come to life. Its eyes burned with a vicious, unholy glow, 
and its once fallen body, which Agito had nearly destroyed moments ago, was now completely restored, as if the battle had never happened. Udium raised his massive claws to block, but the sword's aura of divine fire crashed into them with the force of a thousand storms. The impact reverberated through the air, and for the first time, Odium was forced back, his claws scraping against the ground as if trying to stop an unstoppable force. Agito's strike was precise, aimed at the creature's vulnerable points, exploiting every weakness he could find. The divine power of the dragon god, long dormant within his blood, seemed to push him beyond his limits. In the end, you are a relic of the past. The cavern was eerily silent now, save for the distant echoes of Odium's desperate breathing. The battle that had raged for what seemed like an eternity had reached its bitter climax. Odium lay on the ground, his monstrous form bleeding and broken, but even in his weakened state, there was a defiance in his eyes. But he was not finished yet. His voice, ragged and strained, spoke the words that would haunt the silence of the dungeon. Failing to see through our plan. Odium rasped, his eyes flickering with defiance, even as the life drained from him. And you died thinking you'd saved the world. Despite his victory, Agito could not shake the feeling that something larger loomed over the battlefield something that Odium had been a part of, something that went far beyond this single encounter. His eyes, though dull with the weight of death, still burned with defiance, hatred, and a hint of bitter amusement. Suddenly, a voice sliced through the stillness like a blade. Mitsuruji, the name was spoken with sharp clarity, cutting through Agito's thoughts like a razor. She spun around, her eyes narrowing as she scanned the shadows. The air around them felt tense, thick with the weight of impending doom. The once vibrant city, now in ruins, stood as a grim testament to the devastation that had unfolded. With a cold, detached expression, Odium turned toward the person standing before him. His voice, when it came, was devoid of emotion a mere statement, unburdened by any trace of regret or sorrow. There's no world you can save anymore, he declared, his words carrying the finality of a death sentence. The words seemed to hang in the air, sinking deep into the hearts of those who still clung to hope, to the belief that something could be done. But Odium's presence, his aura of overwhelming power, made such thoughts seem almost absurd. His very being radiated the conviction that this was the end, that salvation was no longer an option. Agito, caught between disbelief and anger, clenched their fists at their sides, their heart racing. They had fought for so long, enduring countless trials and battles, always with the belief that they could turn things around that they could save the world. But now, standing before this figure of darkness, the weight of Odium's words felt suffocating. Odium's eyes narrowed, an icy sheen of sweat breaking across his brow. He could feel it the deep, gnawing pain that was creeping up from his wounds. The blade the protagonist had driven into his body was no ordinary strike. It was infused with a force that even his near-mortal regeneration couldn't easily counter. The blood stains on his dark robes grew darker, a stark contrast to the relentless glow of his aura. Impossible, Odium muttered under his breath, his voice strained, almost pained. It was a rare thing for him to express such a sentiment one of doubt, of weakness, but it was undeniable. The wound was too deep. The power that Agito wielded was beyond what he had anticipated. His regeneration had always been one of his greatest assets almost a guarantee that he could survive any injury, no matter how grave. But, so deep, Odium hissed through clenched teeth. My regeneration can't keep up. Agito's expression softened almost imperceptibly as he regarded his opponent. There was no malice in his gaze, no desire for dominance. Only the weary acceptance of a man who had long since stopped believing in the ideals that once drove him. You're right, Agito replied calmly, his voice low but clear. He took a step back, his sword steady in his hand. I am no hero. The words hung in the air quiet but heavy. Odium, still reeling from his own failing regeneration, blinked in confusion. He gritted his teeth, a mix of fury and pain flashing in his eyes as he looked at Agito, so many comrades sacrificed themselves in that war, Agito's words came out softly, as though he were speaking to himself more than to Odium. He didn't look at the other man as he continued, 
his voice steady but filled with an undeniable weight. And yet the peace we won, lasted only a hundred years. Agito's sword arm trembled slightly, though he didn't lower it. The genius swordsman where Agito says, I won't let it happen again, and, for the sake of my old comrades and their descendants. This part of the story highlights Agito's internal resolve and the deep sense of responsibility he carries for the sacrifices made in the past. Agito's mind drifted back to those days those painful memories. His friends, his comrades, their faces. He had failed them once. He had watched them die, all for a fleeting peace. It was a failure that had never left him, one that haunted his every step, even now. Agito's eyes hardened with an unbreakable resolve. This time, he said, his voice barely above a whisper, but the conviction behind the words was undeniable, this time I will save this world. But Odium, with every ounce of his remaining energy, snarled and snapped. Shut up, he growled, his voice rough and strained, as if the words were being wrenched from him. His eyes burned with anger, desperation, and defiance. The sheer audacity of Agito's calmness the way he stood there as though this was just another day made Odium seethe. He had fought tooth and nail to survive, to defeat Agito, and yet here he was, on his knees, helpless. Agito didn't even seem moved. In one smooth, almost effortless motion, Agito moved closer to Odium, his movements precise and measured. He crouched down beside him, his eyes never leaving Odium's, and then, Without a word, he reached out and placed his hand firmly on Odium's head. Odium froze, it was then that Odium's voice broke the silence, low but filled with venom. To think that I would lose to a failed hero like this, he spat, his words dripping with contempt. The bitterness in his voice was undeniable. Odium, though still defiant, seemed to shrink under the weight of Agito's presence. He was no longer a mere survivor of a long-forgotten war. The Hakenryu sword style, the eight sword style, was an ancient and legendary technique, passed down through generations. It was a style that merged swordsmanship with incredible speed and precision, each strike delivering a blow faster than the eye could follow. The piercing moon was Agito's ultimate attack so named for its precision, its power, and the way it seemed to cut through the very fabric of reality itself. The attack didn't just strike it pierced. With the force of a falling star and the grace of a celestial body, the blade targeted Odium's heart. As Agito releases the full force of his piercing moon magic, a torrent of energy surges through the battlefield, cutting through the air with a radiant brilliance. For Odium, a being who had once been human but had been transformed into a monstrous version of himself, perhaps through a curse, a dark magic, or an internal struggle, the attack's impact is profound. Odium calls out Lord Rubel after being back as a human. Agito, standing at a distance, watches as the magic fades. There's a silent understanding between them. Agito's gaze is not one of judgment but one of quiet acknowledgement. Suddenly, a voice calls out from behind him, sharp and commanding. Explain. It's Amazaki. Agito turns slightly, sensing the weight of the words. He knows this confrontation was inevitable. Amazaki, the person who has always watched him with suspicion, whose eyes have been focused on Agito's every move, now demands answers. The chilled air of the Chubu region in Japan cuts through the towering structures of the Special A Gate, Abyss, the headquarters of some of the most elite adventurers in the world. Tuo Molina, an S-rank adventurer known as Eternal Glacier, steps forward. Her presence is commanding, her short, blue hair flowing behind her like a frozen cascade, and her icy blue eyes sharp with the focus of a seasoned warrior. As always, her attire is a blend of formality and functionality, elegant yet battle-ready, with a faint aura of frost emanating from her body, a reflection of her control over the ancient, freezing magic she wields. Tuoma Lina begins, her voice steady but carrying the weight of the news. The monster who claimed to be the deputy of the six dragons has been defeated. And a voice came out saying that, so the Six Dragons revival, it seems our prediction is correct. Without an S rank, secondary casualties might have occurred. Tuoma calmly says that, is finding the Six Dragons location next, she also asks for additional staff, because they haven't had a break lately. The guild master replied, don't worry, we've already found a candidates. And presenting Mitsurugi Ajito's information. 
Apparently he single-handedly defeated the deputy of the six dragons, Rubel, who called himself Odium. Toma said, so they say. A man with a white hair and a purple eyes appeared, he is an S-rank divine thunder, Udo Rico. He can't believe that a man without power and a swordsman in this day and age and atop of that a solo clear. It must be a mistake, Udo said. The guild master said that it's either Toma or Udo will do and see if his skills are real. And if he has the skills, Udo and Toma asked for a permission to recruit him to Seraphim. Udo has no choice but check whether the skills of Agito is real. Udo said to Toma that he will leave the report to Toma. And Toma said that, you just don't want to write a report. In this scene, Udo unleashed his power thunderstrike to test Agito's skills and saying, I'll see for myself. That's all for today, thank you so much for watching. Please comment, like and subscribe for more content like this. Till next time.